Thanks, Rory. So as a recap for just forming urine, it's at the level of the nephron, you have the afferent arterial bringing blood into the glomerulus. The glomerulus is surrounded by the Bowman's capsule. It's extracting out of the blood all, everything that it can. Liquid, small solutes, good things, wasteful things, all kinds of stuff. So what's left in the blood as it leaves the glomerulus and goes out that efferent arterial is just sludge blood. You know, it's got thick, it's thick because most of the water has been removed. It has chunky um, red blood cells and it's got large molecules like hormones and albumin. So, but we don't want to have this sludge blood for long. So the fluid and all the dissolved solutes, all the good and bad that was pulled out of the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule it starts to go into that proximal convoluted tubule. In the proximal convoluted tubule is where immediately we pump back sodium so that water will follow. Water, we don't have any pumps for water, so we have to move water by moving sodium. So that's happening right away in the proximal convoluted tubule. So that efferent arterial is turning into the peritubular capillaries. Peritubular means peri means around. So the sludge blood and this efferent arterial is coming into the peritubular capillaries, which are right adjacent to the proximal convoluted tubule. So all of that water, the sodium, the glucose, potassium, magnesium, all these things get immediately returned to the blood. So that's the job of the proximal convoluted tubule. Send all the good stuff back to the blood as soon as possible. And so we have microvilli in the proximal convoluted tubule because that is going to increase the surface area. So we have more surface to get this water and all of these great ions and glucose and everything that we want good back into the blood, into that peritubular capillary. The stuff that's left in the tubule, <clears throat> excuse me, is just the waste. It's still stuff that we're planning on just continue. Whatever stays in the tubule goes out via the urine. So this stuff is called filtrate. Filtrate is in the tubule. It's inside the proximal convoluted tubule. Stuff that we send out, <clears throat> excuse me, back out to the peritubular capillaries is um, that process is known as reabsorption. Reabsorption is very specific. It's from the filtrate to the blood, where when we get to the farther end of the nephron, the distal convoluted tubule, that's where secretion takes place. Secretion is the opposite, from the blood to the tubule. So those are very precise with regard to their direction that the fluid is traveling. So we have their proximal convoluted tubule, primar primarily reabsorbing water, glucose, all kinds of other nutrients and ions. Then we get into the lupa henle. You have that descending limb, that's the thin limb, squamous cells, easy for water to diffuse out. The thick limb is going back up thick because it's cuboidal cells pumping out sodium. So it's pre-pumped all this sodium into the hairpin U-turn portion that water then is just gonna diffuse out. So the lupa henle by its configuration maximizes the reabsorption of water. And then we finally get into the distal convoluted tubule and the kidney says, I'm done doing what we got back with all the good stuff in the proximal. We got extra water back in the lupa henle. Distal, anybody else need something done? This is where hormones from elsewhere in the body can target to say, yeah, we need more water retained. That might be antidiuretic hormone or aldosterone is gonna do that. Or no, we have too much blood volume. We need to dump some extra water out. Um, that would be atrial natriuretic peptide. So all that adjustment is taking place in the distal convoluted tubule. In addition, in the distal convoluted tubule, we have secretion that takes place. So any of these larger chunky substances that didn't get filtered in the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, but is still waste, but is still in the blood, it gets pumped from the blood into the tubule, into the filtrate. So we're sort of forcing it into the tubule so we could send it out the urine. So the end of the distal convoluted tubule goes to the collecting duct. The collecting duct runs down into that renal pyramid. So there are these 
pyramid structure. So at the very bottom cone are the, dis are the collecting ducts arriving there. Lots of them from lots of different um, nephron points and a single collecting duct receiving from many, many nephrons. So <clears throat> the bottom of those collecting ducts are just dripping out the papilla of the renal pyramid straight into the minor calyx. So that is your nephron recap. Any questions on that? that we can kind of cover before we go on. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over back to our PowerPoint slide. Let me just find the share screen. Okay. All right, so here in our, sh here we have, let me get rid of these guys here. Okay, um, so here's our, so if I'm just roll, scrolling through a bunch of our slides, okay. The guinea pig, here's my husband. He's the one that usually feeds her, even though it should be my daughter. So every time she hears Boots walking by, she starts screeching. Okay, so we are gonna talk about some funky stuff, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now, I think I left off, let me put this slide up here. I left off, whoops, that's not the one you wanna look at. But I clicked on the one, there we go. Okay. So we left off talking about, here's the nephron, I gave you the verbal recap, but then I also said, hey, I just lied to you because the nephron isn't really shaped like this. So the nephron is indeed shaped like this, it's just not configured like this. So we see the, let me grab my pen, the glomerulus here, and then we see the, dis, the collecting duct and stuff over here. The glomerulus, if we were to pivot, do like a, a dotted line here, and we were to pivot the, um, the whole nephron around, so we actually have the glomerulus over here, and then you have the proximal convoluted tubule, and then the lupa henle comes down this way. That's really how it's configured. It's not stretched out like this. So this way is the way that if I have an identification slide that I want you to name the glomerulus, the proximal convoluted tubule, I'll probably put a diagram like this because it's just easier to deal with and easier to see. But in reality, it's actually folded back on itself. And one of the reasons is we're gonna talk about the juxtaglomerular apparatus is because a part of the distal convoluted tubule that you see here, is actually right here. And what's important about it being right there is that it's between the afferent and efferent arterioles, and it's on its way just before it gets the collecting duct. So I want you to see this, but I'm gonna show you an image um, where it's coming up here. So this image right here, we can see that that's the distal convoluted tubule. And you're like, how did that get way over there if we have the whole kidney drawn stretched out? So this is truly how it is in these guys here. Okay, and both of these. So <clears throat> we're going to start with the glomerulus right here. Actually, maybe I'll get a different color. Oh, I hate when it does that. Sorry. Once it does this whole magnifying thing, it's like impossible. It takes a lot of effort to get it to actually change the color. Okay, so we have our glomerulus Bowman's capsule. We have our proximal convoluted tubule coming along here. That's gonna be in green. Then we do our Lupa Henle coming down back up, but notice <clears throat> it's actually going to curve back towards that glomerulus. And so I'm just gonna draw it as a really thick section. So right there is the distal convoluted tubule. We're done with the lupa henle, but it's coming right back next to the glomerulus. So I'm gonna scoot back here. So our glomerulus or the renal corpuscle is what I really should be referring to it as because that's the whole unit where it's the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. I sort of just call it the glomerulus, but that's, not as accurate. I should really be saying renal corpuscle. And so what's important is the afferent arterial is bringing blood into the glomerulus within the renal corpuscle. And as it brings blood in, 
it's actually swiping by a whole series of cells. And these cells here are known as our juxtaglomerular cells. I think that's on this here. These guys right here. Juxta is sort of a fancy way of saying next to, next to the glomerulus. So I'm gonna go show you this picture. So we can see these juxtaglomerular cells the whole unit here, because we're gonna talk about some cells that's in the distal convoluted and tubules known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So this is where we're getting our $100 words for this particular chapter. What's important for the juxtaglomerular cells, that's the part we're talking about, because that is about the blood. Maybe at this point I should probably make the blood red. So let me go back to my red color. So we have red blood arriving into the glomerulus. Our juxtaglomerular cells are the cells that are located along the afferent arterial. So it's really checking out the blood as it's entering the afferent arterial. So I'm gonna go back to here. It is within these juxtaglomerular cells that we're checking out the blood and we have chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. So the chemoreceptor, the particular chemical it's looking for, is actually oxygen. So in this case, in the blood, if we have, let me erase all this here, if we have low, I'm gonna put low O2, because maybe you're up at altitude, then you're gonna release erythropoietin. Who can remember where erythropoietin what it does, where does it go, what does it do? Do a stop share so we can have someone answer that. We did erythropoietin when we did the blood. Anyone brave enough? Okay, erythro tells you red, red blood cell. So erythropoietin is going to tell your bone marrow to make more red blood cells. So we'll go back to the share screen. Go share. All right. So if we have low, here, here, low oxygen, it's going to release erythropoietin. That's going to go to the bone marrow, and that will increase red blood cell production. So then that way you can increase your hematocrit or increase your red blood cells because you're going to be at high altitude or whatever conditions, which is the only natural conditions that you're going to have low oxygen. Okay. So let's get rid of this. Race. Also in those juxtaglomerular cells, after we've checked out the blood for oxygen levels, we're also checking out with our baroreceptors for pressure. Baro means pressure. So it's a pressure sensor in there. And if the pressure is really low, I'm going to say low, and we'll just say BP for blood pressure, then we're going to release renin. And then we're going to go through that whole renin, angiotensin, form an angiotensin 2, that whole renin angiotensin system. We're going to talk about that again today. We already did that in the blood vessels, but we're going to talk about it again today. So that's that. Then in this juxtaglomerular apparatus, we had the cells here. The cells are checking out the blood. Let me just right here, check out blood. It's gonna check out blood for oxygen and it's gonna check out blood for pressure. Okay, so those are the two things you should know for the juxtaglomerular cells. Now I'm gonna change colors. And we'll talk about the macula densa. So we'll go to the picture. The macula densa cells are actually here on the edge of the distal convoluted tubule. So here, I'll color the macula densas in green. I'll go back to my red. And then I'm going to color the juxtaglomerular cells in red. So we'll do juxtaglomerular, make that little circle. The juxtaglomerular cells, they're going to sense pressure, they're going to sense oxygen, they're checking out the blood. While the, back to green, macula densa cells, 
in the distal convoluted tubule is actually checking out the filtrate. The filtrate is going to become urine because there ought to be a collecting duct over here that this distal convoluted tubule is about to dump into. So this is where we are able to compare, we'll go back here. So we have cells here in the distal and we're able to compare the solute concentration. So there's chemoreceptors in there, but we don't have to utilize the word chemoreceptor. That way we can just focus them on the juxtaglomerular side. So solute concentration, that means whatever we have going in the distal convoluted tubule that's about to become urine, say we have, heavens forbid, extra magnesium. We love magnesium and we actually need magnesium and most people are deficient in magnesium. So but that just popped in my head to utilize. So in this distal convoluted tubule, say we have a whole bunch of magnesium getting dumped out. Um, but maybe we have, I'll just draw it really small. Maybe we have only tiny bits of magnesium in the blood. It's a way for us to compare, hey, what's about to be peed out? Is that indeed something that we have too much of in the blood? Or maybe it was only transient. Maybe there was a whole bunch of magnesium at one point. We were dumping it out because we had plenty extra in the blood, but no longer. Our blood is back to normal levels, so maybe we don't want to kick out this much magnesium. It's a way for us to adjust what's going on in the whole rest of the nephron that I'm sort of squilling around here. The macula densa double checks what we're dumping out into the urine is indeed what we have too much of coming into the blood. It's a checks and balance kind of situation where it's able to then send signals to the rest of the nephron to maybe not remove not to leave so much in the filtrate. Maybe we want to, you know, retain some more of, some, of one of the solutes. So on this slide, I want you to realize this whole juxtaglomerular apparatus, these are these cells that are either in the distal convoluted tubule in the macula densa section, or they're in the afferent arterial wall for the juxtaglomerular side. And so one is checking out the blood, the other is, this is gonna write check out filtrate. And we're double checking what gets dumped from the filtrate and ultimately in the urine is indeed, as far as a solute, what we have too much of in the blood. Okay. Any questions on that? So, um, Anything you can blurt it right out. Any questions on the nephron? Okay. And if you still have other questions, just blurt it out. Even while the screen share is on, just unmute yourself and blurt it out. So this is another picture, a little other schematic picture that might be a little prettier than what I can draw. So if we have our, you know, Bowman's capsule, dang it, where's my pen? Sorry. Bowman's capsule going here. We have our pink, or sorry, our purple proximal convoluted tubule. We've got that going here. And then we go down to the loop of Henle, back up and notice the pink distal convoluted tubule. Part of this distal convoluted tubule is coming here right adjacent to that Y formation where we have the afferent arterial on this side and the efferent on this side. So that's, this is how truly a nephron is actually built and actually set up. So we've learned about it when it was all stretched out, but in, it's packaged in the kidney in this folded up formation. So <clears throat> blood pressure hormones. Well, we already mentioned one of them from the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and that was renin. So we're going to go back and recap that renin story for those of you that need a refresher from our vessels. So these are the four blood pressure hormones you need to learn. The good news is you already learned them in unit two. So we already talked about all four of these, but it's been a while, so we'll certainly spend some time talk, reviewing them. But if you have questions, you can refer back to those notes or that lecture or just let me know. So antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone act the same. 
They pretty much do exactly the same thing. They just do them for different reasons. They have a different negative feedback loop. What's going to turn it on and what's going to turn it off is totally different from either one. But their ultimate action is the same. They both at the distal, so I'm going to put at the distal convoluted tubule, all of the, well, sorry. These guys here at the distal convoluted tubule are going to retain water, put retain H2O. How does it retain water? Because we don't have any water pumps. It has to do it by pumping sodium, pumping Na plus from the distal convoluted tubule to the blood. And that would be in the peritubular capillaries. Or just capillary if we're talking about a one to see. So that's how they both work. Anti and they ultimately will increase blood volume. You can see that here because they're retaining water. We were, um, I jokingly referred to anti-diuretic hormone in unit one. We talked about the endocrine system as the don't pee hormone. You're just retaining more water. So there's less in the urine. Put this here. Less in urine because we retain the water in the blood. So I'll connect these two. So more water is in the blood, less is in the urine. That is how both anti-diuretic hormone and aldosterone works. As I mentioned, they do it for different reasons. Antidiuretic hormones from the pituitary gland, and it tends to notice if you're, say you're um, sweating a lot and, um, or you're not drinking enough water, and so you're getting more concentrated. Your solute level in your body is getting higher. So the amount of dissolved substances compared to your water is out of balance. So it wants you to drink more water. But if you're not drinking more water, it's actually having you retain water and not pee as much out. Aldosterone, on the other hand, is doing it solely for the purpose of blood volume. It's one that's doing it for the purpose of blood pressure. So it wants to increase blood volume in order to raise blood pressure. Now the other one, let me erase everything here, do it in blue, atrial natriuretic peptide or atrial natriuretic factor. The book textbooks call them two different things, um, peptide or factor, either one. It comes from the right atrium and it's the only one that decreases blood volume, which means it's going to decrease blood pressure. How does it do it? Also at the distal convoluted tubule, it's going to pump sodium from the blood to the filtrate. So this is actually, that would be secretion because you're going from the blood to the filtrate and then water will follow into the distal convoluted tubule, so you have more water in urine. It's our natural diuretic. So those three, I'm going to put my green back on, this, aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, those three target the distal convoluted tubule. The two in green are going to retain sodium, bring more sodium back into the blood so we retain more water. Atrial natriuretic peptide is gonna dump more sodium into the distal convoluted tubule and let more water out. So that's the two roles of those two. The one that we're about to do now, go to red, is angiotensin II. This one does not target the distal convoluted tubule. This one, if you recall, targets the tunica media of our arterioles. This is the one that's going to have the most dramatic effect on blood pressure. This one also then tells the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. So it's actually how aldosterone got released in the first place. 
but aldosterone then targets the distal convoluted tubule. Angiotensin II does one job here, adrenal cortex, to release aldosterone. Its other job is vasoconstriction. to increase blood pressure. So vasoconstriction is just the idea of making your vessels smaller. Like if you have a hose out in a garden, you just put your thumb over the end of the hose. The outlet now just got smaller, so the pressure is higher. Okay, so now we sure made a mess of this slide. So I want you to know the green and blue circled elements in this slide are targeting are going to the distal convoluted tubule. So we'll get rid of the red here. Um, and then we'll come, we'll talk more about angiotensin 2 in these subsequent slides. So the increase in blood pressure obviously are these two because they're going to increase blood volume. So you just put more blood into the same vessel, these vessels, so it's gonna make it more pressure. You just added more blood to it. So that's gonna ultimately then increase blood pressure. Angiotensin II, because of its vasoconstriction nature, has a dramatic increase in just blood pressure. It's just making those vessels smaller. We now have smaller pipes, and so the pressure is higher versus atrial nitric peptide or factor is going to decrease it. So how do we ultimately get angiotensin II? Well, we started from renin. And remember where renin started. Renin came from the baroreceptors. Let me see, we'll go up here. We'll go baroreceptors in the juxtaglomerular cells. in that afferent arterial, okay? So if you recall, we release renin because of low pressure. If the kidney feels low pressure coming in, the kidney freaks out and says, I cannot do my filtering job. I can't make urine if I don't have enough pressure in this glomerulus. So this is low pressure, we're gonna say in the afferent arterial. So this is leading into that glomerulus. So if the pressure is really low, at the point you get to the glomerulus, you're not going to filter anything. None of the stuff is going to come out, and then the kidney can't do its job. So the kidney releases renin. Renin goes into the blood, goes to the peritubular capillaries, comes back out. While it's in the blood, it actually combines with angiotensinogen. That's just a protein circulating the blood, normally does nothing in your blood until it hooks up with renin. These two to combined becomes angiotensin. Sometimes we just refer to it as angiotensin one, just to distinguish it from angiotensin two. So now angiotensin one is now returning back up to the lungs. At the point of the lungs, it will then go through angiotensin converting enzyme. As we know, this is the ACE enzyme, um, or ACE, the e enzyme is redundant. And then we make the very potent angiotensin II. And that gets sent throughout the whole body, causes massive vasoconstriction and a dramatic increase in blood pressure. Here we are, we finish our, we fix our low blood pressure and our kidneys are happy again. So here's my little schematic. We've already seen this. We did this in class when we were doing the vessels. So at the point of the kidneys where the kidneys detect low blood pressure, the kidneys will release renin because of that. Renin, oh sorry, in the blood returning to the heart, renin plus angiotensin, synogen, becomes angiotensin. So I put in bold and caps the actual hormone names that are converted. Notice angiotensinogen is just a protein that's helping to convert into this first angiotensin. So now we have angiotensin arriving into the heart. 
the heart and this specifically the right side of the heart because it's coming up through the inferior vena cava. Kidneys released renin, renin angiotensin, so this is going into the veins. And so we have this here is going through the inferior vena cava into the right side of the heart. We remember the right side of the heart then sends this angiotensin into the lungs. In the lungs, we have the, and as we go to both lungs here, I guess, angiotensin converting enzyme. We have angiotensin converting enzyme in other places throughout the body as well. It's not only the lungs. The lungs just have a very large concentration of angiotensin converting enzyme. So it's through the lungs here that we form angiotensin II. That's ultimately going to return back to the heart, specifically the left side of the heart, and then it's gonna then be propelled out throughout the entire body through the systemic circulation, which is gonna then cause massive vasoconstriction. So we're going to the tunica media, remember that's this muscle part of our muscular arterioles, not the big ones and not our tiny capillaries, those in between ones, we have hundreds and thousands and millions of those. And so if each one of those even constricts even a tiny bit, the blood pressure is going to go up very, very rapidly. And then the heart has to pump a lot harder in order to push the blood through. And that's really the effect of angiotensin II. So we have this dramatic increase in blood pressure. This is another schematic. I pull, I just copied this over. So if it's not in your notes, don't freak out. It's technically in your notes for the blood vessels. I just copied that animation and this slide from your um, vessel in unit two, um, if you wanna see this. So this is just telling you angiotensin two, we have our vasoconstriction. And then we also have aldosterone. Remember it goes to your adrenal glands, sends aldosterone out so that you could then retain more water. So we also talked, this is also from your blood vessel lecture. So this is just kind of a recap because I wanted to tell you a little bit more um, or remind you about ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are blocking the conversion. So we can see we have our angiotensin one and in the lungs, remember ACE is happening in the lungs mostly. And then that's where we convert angiotensin two. Well, ACE inhibitors, are going to block this conversion. So if we block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, then you're not going to get this dramatic increase in blood pressure. So this is why ACE inhibitors are one of the most prescribed antihypertensive medications. There's another set of drugs down here, the um, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. They call them ARBs. Um, so these ARBs, what they do, so I have this little picture over here. So you have a, a vessel, this is our, tunic, uh, our muscular arterial. And if we take a little section out here, we can see the endothelium on the inside. And then we see our muscular layer here of our tunica media. So if we have this giant receptor, this would be our angiotensin II receptor. So I just put A2 for angiotensin II, that would be that and that. So that's where the receptor is going to go. And then it's gonna tell the smooth muscle massive vasoconstriction. And then we're gonna have a tiny little lumen and increase our blood pressure. So what do ARBs do? An ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker, is basically a drug that just goes in and plugs up the receptor. So angiotensin II can't do its job. So you can see either you don't make angiotensin II because you blocked it by an ACE inhibitor or you plugged up the blockers. Basically, both of those mechanisms prevent angiotensin II from being effective. So that is how most blood pressure is managed. But I did wanna bring up to you, in light of our current situation, the coronavirus or COVID-19 actually functions through this. And some of the, um, well, actually before I go this, so see this crazy slide, you don't have to know it for your class. I have to know it for a class I'm taking. But what I want you to see here is angiotensin II, it actually functions through this AT1 receptor. 
that's not angiotensin one, it just happens to be number one receptor for angiotensin two. So what it's doing is it's you know doing a lot of vasoconstriction as we just talked about, and it's increasing blood pressure and causes oxidation, causes inflammation. But what I want to point out is this AT1 receptor, the angiotensin II, so which is really the same receptor that I drew here. I wanted to point out, I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment, get my mouse to work. And um, the AT1 receptor, so this receptor that angiotensin II works on, weirdly enough, actually is on T cells. So part of our immune system. That was like mind boggling. There was a paper about that a couple years ago. And it like, you know, cardi cardiologists don't talk to immunologists. They're like two different universes. It's like they don't even talk the same language. So um, that's why half the time I don't know what Evans is talking about. So anyways, you know, angiotensin II receptors on a T cell What's up with that? So there is a huge immunological component between the cardiovascular system and our immunolo immunological system. And it was never very well understood and very few cardiologists really even make the link. But now with COVID, that's how it works. And it's also how it has become more dangerous. So I'm gonna do a screen share on just a quick little paper that I just looked up for you guys this morning. So I'm not as familiar, but what this paper is, is um, from just a journal, Physicians Weekly. There's actually a, a bigger paper that with published stuff. This is more just a little summary here, but it's actually warning people of the risk of certain antihypertensive drugs. So normal people that are on blood pressure medications need to actually watch out. And um, because the COVID-19 functions through this mechanism. So if we see in this picture here in A, we see a normal, my pen doesn't work on this particular, um, when I'm on this slide, but we can see here that angio in A, or angiotensin with renin, AT1, we have the red circle, that's ACE1, we form AT2, that's the second square, and so we can see it's that second square targets, what is it, a blue pentagon and a green square, and it's telling you what it normally does. And so we take ACE inhibitors and we block that. However, in B, notice if you have SARS COVID-2 or some variation, which COVID-19 is indeed this, notice the very bottom rectangle, acute respiratory distress syndrome and pulmonary edema with COVID-19 patients. How it's working is actually through this AT1R. So see where the blue pentagon is? That's the thing I circled on my crazy other blue slide, but it's actually how COVID's working. So they're actually concerned about patients. Um, let me see where I said it. That you want to you should let's see the first sentence. It says clinicians should consider withholding angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers because of a potential increased risk of worse clinical outcomes in patients with the coronavirus. So anyways, so anyways, it was kind of a new thing. There was crazy stuff with this coronavirus. I was looking at, um, saw some images of a guy with cardiomyopathy. Their heart is having a big problem. He was completely asymptomatic. He didn't have any fever. He didn't have any cough, but he had this dramatic cardiomyopathy. He started to have a failing heart and then they tested him and he was actually had the coronavirus. So it is a crazy virus. It's attacking people in inconsistent ways. People, many of the people that you see that are dying um, that they said, oh, this is a young person and nothing was wrong with them very, very likely he had some sort of underlying cardiovascular disease that he was not yet aware of. And so those people seem to be really, really susceptible. I'm not an immunologist, so I'm not sort of, I'm just saying for the, one of the mechanisms, this could be an underlying mechanisms for people. So I always wanted to make you give you a heads up because the ACEs and ARBs or ACE inhibitors and ARBs are hugely popular for antihypertensive medications and people on them may want to consider visiting with their cardiologist about that um, because it actually may exacerbate coronavirus um, etiology. Okay, so we're not done yet. Any questions?
I have a quick question. What would be an example of an ACE and an ARB? Like actually like pharmaceutically, like a name. Oh, I'm so bad. Um, I have to look up there. Um, there, I'm going to look it up really quick because it, they're a family of drugs. So it's like, was it, um, they're super common. Um, ACE inhibitor. I just have to just look it up because I am really bad on the clinical names. Da -da -da, da -da -da, people, names of them. ACE inhibitor, typing drugs. Lisinopril, Catapril, Ramipril, any of those prills. They all do these weird families. So the different ones are different brands, but Lisinopril, yeah, Ramipril, Catapril, those are the ones that are listed here. And then the ARBs. Our drug list. Okay. And the ARBs um, are Valsartan, Losartan. Those are the, the N's in Sartan, Aldiosartan. Um, anyway, so one of the options that they're actually at, um, that I read, I have, I mean, I just, I've been knowing about that the angiotensin 2 connection. And then I thought it just dawned on me this morning. I'm like, oh, we're going to talk about it today. Let me just look up something really quick. So I don't have the real answer. One little thing, some of the alternatives that you could, a person would be prescribed if they can't take an ACE or an ARB would be looking at calcium channel blockers. You can actually do aldosterone blockers, um, even beta blockers. Most people hate those, but these second generation, the early beta blockers are bad. Um, the second, third generation beta blockers are a lot better. So those are some alternatives that people may want to look at if they have to manage their hypertension during this COVID virus issue. Um, okay, so let's go back. Any other questions? Good question, Jackie. Alrighty, so I'll go back to our lecture, see where we're at. Okay, so I just added that. So this whole angiotensin, we have our AT1s. Actually, again, don't have to point this out, but what if you are blocking, so you have an ACE inhibitor up here, but that's not. If you're blocking ACE inhibitors, you're actually, it's less about blocking what happens here and more about driving more action this other way. It's kind of a crazy way. So you actually, it does some good things if you drive it the right way. Anyways, so that's for another conversation. Okay. So bottom line, what does the angiotensin do? Raises our blood pressure because massive vasoconstriction. And it tells aldosterone, hey, retain water. So it's a double whammy. Not only does it make your pipe smaller by space of constriction, you're filling it up with more blood with the help of aldosterone and re retention in the kidneys. Okay. Now we have urine. Let's deal with the urine. So this, I think, is a super cool slide. And I wonder if the ant, oh, this ant, so you can see it's fine. It came from my Instagram, and some of my Instagram things I just bring over as far as a picture. Sometimes I actually bring it as a uh, video, but I can't, this one, the video's not working. I think all it did was rotate it around so you can see the sides. But it's really cool. This is the full bladder. Look at the bladder here. This person, when you go get this done, you have to sit there and really hold it in because they want your bladder nice and full. But we can see the kidneys up here. You can kind of see the kidney. Two beautiful kidneys. We can see, you know, the renal um, pelvis here, and then we have the ureters going down. Here's the ureter here. Now, one thing I want to point out is the ureter is going down, and it actually enters in there. It, what I'm telling you is, it enters in the back side. So this is the back side of the ladder, but it's actually going in on the bottom. Most of the time, you see drawings done incorrectly. It always shows the kidneys attaching the ureters like to the top of the bladder, and it's not true. So this picture I like, especially if it rotated because you could see it a lot more clearly. But we can see the minor, look at these cute little minor calyxes up here. And then you can see they become major calyxes. And then we ultimately have the renal pelvis, and then we have the ureter. Okay, so we have the formation of urine. We remember we do filtration at the renal corpuscle, reabsorption along the tubules, mostly proximal convoluted tubules. We get extra water back up the loop and then finally secretion in the distal convoluted tubule. 
So what's left over, so the leftover stuff is in the filtrate, becomes urine. Okay, what's in urine? Mostly water. And the remainder is just solutes. It's really yellow, so we expect it based, based on the group. If you took vitamins in the morning and it becomes fluorescent yellow, that's usually because of B vitamins. And remember, we talked about the renal threshold. So if you bought vitamins and it has, you know, a, if you're looking at one vitamin and said, I'm taking this because it's got, you know, 800 micrograms of something or milligrams or micrograms actually of some B vitamin, you're going to think that's way better than this other one that only has 200. Well, the 200, you're less likely to pee most of it out. Your body can use what you're getting it and you can just take more of them through the day. So anyways, the renal thresholds, if you remember, we talked about that, what gets up in the urine. The odor of urine could be, obviously, people have issues with certain foods they eat, um, but if urine sits around for a while, the odor is because of ammonia. We actually, we're going to learn about this in a moment when we talk about pH, but with our pH changes, it's ammonium, um, <coughs> excuse me, that's NH4, and after it sits, in like the urine, like you peed it in the toilet and you didn't flush, then the NH4 separates and becomes NH3, which is ammonia, and that's smelly. Um, our urine can vary in pH level. If people have more of a meat diet, it's going to be more acidic than people that have more of a vegetarian diet. Um, that may, or may not be good. There's a lot of benefits of vegetarian diet, but I don't necessarily agree with super anti-meat necessarily as far as health. Obviously, people will be anti-meat for um, more moral or social reasons, but um, just because you have super acidic urine doesn't necessarily mean it's bad or good. People make a big deal about that, so it's just a, sort of this um, specific gravity. The specific gravity is really how concentrated your urine is. If your urine is really close to distilled water, then your specific gravity is really close to 1, 1.0. 1.0 is distilled water. The more solutes and more concentrated your urine is, the higher your specific gravity will become. Normally, these are tests that we do in the lab. So when we do our kidney lab, we usually like look at a couple kidneys, and then we do a urine analysis um, evaluation. So we'll go through that process. What are some of the waste components in urine? Well, we just talked about that. So it's ammonium. We can get ammonium from protein metabolism. Remember the deamination. You're going to turn protein into acetyl-CoA, but you can also get ammonium from other ways. But, and we'll talk about actually ammonium. We get it into, from pH balancing too. So protein metabolism and pH balance. We'll see that in the next um, slide set. So that's the urine. We have urea. Um, so there's ammonia and the CO2. It's actually here. When the CO2 leaves after the urine's been sitting there, that's our source of ammonia. Um, creatine sulfates, phosphates, uric, all kinds of junky stuff in here. So urine's just waste. It's stuff that we get out of our body. When we do a urine analysis, you first do a physical examination. This is of the urine. That means you just look at it. That's what it is. Don't do anything crazy. Now, if it was the old days, and old days, I mean like maybe 100 years ago, um, you have people that would drink it. Yeah, gross. You're drinking it because if someone is diabetic, there's a lot of glucose in their urine and it's sweet. Ew. Yeah. So, someone, and that actually is how the words diabetes mellitus came from. So we're used to hearing it as diabetes. So it's right here, it's just weird stare there. So when, um, so diabetes mellitus, mellitus, so we have type one, type two. So we're just calling it type one diabetes or type two diabetes. But diabetes mellitus is what it's really called. Really means sweet urine, gross. Oh my goodness. So they had people that were urine testers by drinking it. So no matter how bad you don't like your job nowadays, it was not that job. So just think on the bright side. Anyway, so that's no longer part of the physical examination, no tasting of it. That's where the dipstick comes in. Thank you, technology. Okay, so 
on the physical examination, you're really just holding up a little beaker and you're saying, hey, is it bloody? Do I see red blood cells in there? You may not see it, so it might be trace blood. Um, do you see epithelial cells? You won't see them under the microscope, but it's going to be really cloudy and murky. And a lot of these things make it nervous. Um, so the physical examination is really going to be, what color is it? How does it smell? Do does it have a lot of particles in? Is it really cloudy? So those are the things that you're just sort of genuinely looking at when you look at your, again, gross. <clears throat> and so when we do our physical examination in the classroom, obviously you hold up our little beakers because someone brings key to class. Well, if you want to, I will force people to bring key to class, but it makes the class a lot more fun if you do, uh, because then you have something to do. So everyone looks at the pee, and is it cloudy, is it whatever, and you know, really make it smell it. But then we spin it around, we put it in test tubes, and I spin it in a centrifuge. And then in our little test tube, we have these cool little test tubes in the lab, and I was, I have a file, but I can, I was looking at the COVID stuff, so I didn't find it. We have test tubes with this weird, really narrow bottom, kind of pointy towards the bottom. And so if you fill it up with urine, so we put urine, and we spin this test tube around, we're going to lean it a little bit to the side. Ultimately, you get I'm going to change colors. You get weird little particles. It looks like white sand at the bottom of this little tube thing. Um, okay. Anyways, you get little particles at the after we spin it. And that is all of these guys, all bunched up down at the bottom. And then for the lab, what we do is we pour off the urine, and then we get a, a microscope slide. Here's a little microscope slide. And we get a little pipette, you know, like a little dropper. And our pipette is going to take from here, we're going to pipette out, and we're going to blob these little particles on our microscope slide. And then we put a little cover slip over it. Okay. And then we look at it under a microscope. And when we look at it under a microscope in class, we're going to see, hopefully not red blood cells, but sometimes we see them. Usually everyone's going to have epithelial cells because it's sloughing off from the, um, from the pelvial pelvis. The ureter has epithelial cells that are sloughing off. The bladder has epithelial cells. There's loads of epithelial cells. Then if we're lucky in class, we get to see really cool crystals. Everyone's got like different kind of variety of crystals because it's based on your diet and your metabolism. So, you know, we'd be looking around and we're scanning our little microscope over here for crystals. Casts are these like weird waxy logs that stuff gets stuck to. And it's just like this debris field. And then you get these like stringy things that look like seaweed floating around through. And the bacteria, we're not looking at it with the high powered microscope. So all they are, are black dots just moving around. And we might see some white blood cells if someone happens to be having a bladder infection because it's the only reason why white blood cells would be, even be there. Okay, so that is our physical examination. And so what this stuff, here's us, I'll erase our pipette. What this stuff is in here, it's known as sediment. And that will probably be a test question. Because I will ask about what is sediment? What is in our urine? What is the physical, physical stuff that's in our urine? Oh, red blood cells, epithelial cells, crystals, casts, mucus, whatever. Tons of cells and stuff. That's just the stuff we can see. That's sediment. Now, the other type of things, change the colors. I like to do dipstick test, which isn't always, I should probably just say dissolved. Dissolved solutes. So it's stuff that we cannot see. pH just tells you, is it going to be acidic or is it going to be alkaline? Specific gravity, how concentrated is your urine? That's sort of not necessarily dissolved. But it's something that we're going to test on a dipstick test. Uh, protein, we really don't see protein. So again, that could be dissolved. Glucose, that's a dissolved solute. And ketones, hi baby. 
My daughter's in here. Give me a guinea pig. Okay. Um, ketones, nitrites, those are also a protein, metabolites, and leukocytes. But leukocytes would be something that we would see that you could actually physically see in sediment. So um, those are things that you would do with a disc. So we would have those if we were in a classroom doing that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, abnormal stuff. This is actually a really good website at the bottom. And if you don't want to copy that whole thing down, if you just type in University of Utah Medical School Web Path Urine, that'll get you. It's the guys, we got a bunch of cartoon sketches of the cells and casts. It has a really simple explanation for each, and the cartoon sketches look like they're hand drawn, are fantastic, especially um, when you compare them to urine in the classroom. But you need to know these terms. Now, most of the terms are super easy. Too much protein, protein urea. Too much glucose, glycosuria. You've got ketone bodies present, ketone urea. Pretty much, they all pretty much say exactly what's wrong. They're self explanatory. The only one that's kind of weird that I think probably need to look at it is if you have white blood cells, it means you have a bladder infection, it's called pyuria. So I don't know whether it's pyuria, but that's what it's called. Otherwise, everything else is what it is bile, because it means you have bilirubin, bilirubinuria, you know, red blood cells, hematuria. So um, you should know the abnormal constituents, and I may ask you something like, you know, what is the pathology was it called someone has too many white, oh, how many white, white blood cells in their urine or what is pyuria so how do we transport urine we've already talked about it from the minor calyx that's here into the major calyx into the renal pelvis into the ureter down into the bladder and then out the body via the urethra so another really cool picture, we can see minor calyces, we can see major calyces, we can see the renal pelvis, we see the ureters going down. But because it's straight in the front, it looks like the ureters are going straight into the top of the bladder. And this is actually why many artists that draw for anatomy textbooks draw the ureters entering the bladder this way. When, because you don't really see a continuing bottom back of this bladder. So when in fact, and they drew it, sort of have the black dotted line saying, hey, the ureters are coming down here, but it's continuing behind the bladder. But here, where it's circled, is the opening of where the ureters enter the bladder. So this here is the bladder. These guys with the black arrows on the upper side, on either side, are the ureters. The ureter opening, so we have these little holes for ureter openings, and then we have a single hole here, it's just weird how it's cut, as the exit. This is the urethral exit. This is a male because this here is the prostate. If it was a female, that would be gone, and the bladder is going to be just sitting here along the muscle wall. So this one happens to be male. But what I want you to know is you have this trigone area. That means the two ureter openings and the single urethral exit. It sort of shows it as a downward slant in this picture, when in fact, of the bladder, it literally is the floor and it's flat. You have these two, so that this trigone, this triangle area is literally this flat base of the bladder. It is within the trigone that, that we have, um, it doesn't move a lot. That's pretty static, the sort of this trigone area. But we have that transitional epithelium so the bladder can get really big and it can shrink down. So it can change size quite a bit through here as far as the bladder goes, not so much in the trigone. The other things that don't move around a lot are the ureters. The ureters are very muscular and they have little elasticity. Um, in fact, a um, surgeon that I used to work with when I was in graduate school, he was the primary anatomy teacher up at the University of Calgary and I was his assistant. And he used to fly up to the, let me stop here for a minute. 
he used to fly up to the Yukon and do surgeries in the small villages that didn't have doctors. So if they called in a doctor, it'd be him that would get the call. And he we used to, like when we did the kidney section, he would always say, absolutely, rule number one, if you're doing any internal surgery, any surgeon has to find the ureters and stay away from it. Because if you were to nip a ureter, that means from the kidney to the bladder, you were to nick that, they because of the musculature they retract and he's like you will you will not get the ends to come back together let alone stitch it back together and so he actually had a colleague that did indeed do that and they could not get the ureter connected they had to take the kidney and move the kidney out of its capsule and down just so they can get the ureter again so that's my little warning to you future surgeons out there that you do not want to cut the orders. Okay. The trigone, I have it colored here because it's important. Oops, there we go, circle. Trigone. It's the two ureter openings and a single urethral opening that is for the exit. The bladder has rugae all within it when it's all scrunched nice and small, and then that rugae smooths out when the bladder gets filled. We have sphincters within the bladder, or actually not within the bladder, we'll call this the urethra. It's in the exit of the bladder. We have the internal urethral sphincter, and it's just the same as we did as far as the anal sphincter. Smooth muscle is involuntary. The external urethral sphincter is made of skeletal muscle, and that part is voluntary. That's the one that you're potty training, or if you have it really bad, you're holding it in because you're conscientiously holding it in, where the internal says, hey, our bladder is full, let's just let it out. So the external urethral sphincter is your override. You should know that the transitional epithelial tissue is the only place in the whole body that it is. And I think that detrusor muscle, but I can test questions on that um, detrusor muscle. Okay, so as far as the urethra goes, it is brings urine out of the body. So if this is our bladder, and look at this really bad picture. Here is our ureter. The ureter doesn't go there. It actually needs to come down and enter more like there. So this is another example where they put the ureter entering the bladder in the wrong place. But it's a nice side view showing us our different urethra. So if we have our urethra, we have to have the three, oh, it throws three sections. We have this first section because this guy here is the prostate. So this green section is the prostatic urethra. Let me draw this next section. This sort of in between as we go across from the body and across this sort of musculature here that are membranous urethra, and that's what females have. It just goes from the bladder out. And then obviously men and not men will have, let me get orange, I guess, the penile urethra, and that's pretty self-explanatory. Going out there, there we go. It's also known as the spongy urethra. Now, the reason why I do the spongy urethra is going to become obvious when we do the reproductive system. But suffice it to say, the tissue here that surrounds it is known as spongy cavernosa. It's a type of erectile tissue that's specific to being around the urethra. So, three urethra for the male and the single urethra for the female. And, okay, that's it for urine and the kidneys. But I am not done with you yet because I was going to, let's see, so we can get started. Yeah, so just to get it out of the way because I have a really short slide set of what you need to know for pH, fluids, acid base kind of thing that I like to just put together with the kidneys. And that way, when we start our next lecture, it will be exclusive to the male reproductive system and we don't have to worry about um, kidneys and pH and more. So I'm going to move on to one more slide set. Anybody have any questions? Blurt it out while I'm looking for the slide set. So let me load it up here. I think I have that here. Okay. Alrighty. Yeah, slide sheet here. Okay, I found it. I forgot that you guys can't see it now. Alrighty. Fluids and electrolytes. 
There we go. So you have the slides for these. This is super simple. So just trying to, there's a lot in your textbook about this. So I, this is a way for me to try to pare down what's in the textbook to just bring you to the basic elements of what you should know for fluids, electrolytes, and pH. I mean, it's, there's a lot more to know. I'm giving you the really low level here, but so you have at least some reference when you deal with this stuff down the road. We're going to do fluid and electrolyte balance. It's just sort of fluid compartments of the body. What are electrolytes? And then the second part, acid base. And really, all I want you to know is what in your body, how do we make acid? And what do we do about it? That's the summary for part two. So here we go. Part one, the fluid compartments of the body. You're either in the cell or you're not. How about that? Inside cells or outside cells? Pretty, that's pretty straightforward. The inside cells is actually two thirds of our body. And it can be the most variable. So we have all kinds of ions. You don't have to memorize these part ions at this point here. But just know the intracellular fluid compartment is the majority. Um, you should also know what makes up the extracellular. That's stuff like your plasma in your blood. The interstitial, that means the fluid between cells. The lymphatic fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid. All of that, we've been spending tons and tons of time on that, but oddly enough, it's only a third of the fluid that's in our body because two thirds are what's within the cells. So this is the schematic thing from an old textbook showing you what our body's made up of. What we're 60% water, 40% solids. The intracellular here is this sort of fluid um, versus the interstitial. These numbers are different than the ones I just gave you. Um, so we have two thirds of the body's water, but showing you intracellular versus interstitial. Okay, so, so I have some normally classes where go through these longer lectures about the components. So I'm going to just roll through these. And yeah, it's easier if I do this on the board. Okay. So we'll skip that part. So what you should know so far is inside the cells is the majority of fluid. Outside our cells is only a third, but what is it? Plasma, lymphatic fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, those are examples of our extracellular fluid. How do we move water around in our body? We do it with these three hormones. Notice it's missing angiotensin too. So these guys, antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone, remember, we're going to retain water. And then switch colors. Okay, we'll do that in purple. And then this one, we lose water. So we're just moving water around. That's really all this slide is. All these hormones that you already had to know, how are we moving water? So it's a bit redundant. This is totally redundant here. We already talked about antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone, sodium resorption, which increases water. So again, this is totally redundant from what we already talked about. We'll go on to the electrolytes. You should know what the main electrolytes are, these ions, and kind of their job. Sodium, we talk a lot about sodium. The more sodium that we retain, the more water we actually put in our extracellular fluid. So sodium is really important. Potassium is mostly, is really important. In fact, this slide is probably your best slide to study your electrolytes. So you should remember in 201, sodium and potassium were used for action potentials. So, I would expect you to know that sodium is used for depolarization and that potassium is used for repolarization. So it has some potential, but I can be more specific. Depolarization, because the sodium goes into the cell, it becomes more positive. As the potassium leaves the cell, it becomes more negative. And that's what repolarization is. You guys should do too much of a stretch. You just associate calcium, obviously, with bone. But remember, it has to contract our cells for our muscles. 
helps the cross bridges, smooths troponin, binds to troponin, moves trouble milestone over. Calcium is used as cofactors. We already know that because it's part of blood clotting. Remember, um, it's actually converting prothrombin into thrombin. Magnesium is frightfully important for our heart. In fact, a lot of cardiomyopathy can be significantly improved by people's nutrition, increasing their nutritional intake of magnesium, which down in lithium levels. Okay, so magnesium is important for bone because you need a balance between magnesium and calcium. Those of you in my keyboard class learned that it's a two to one ratio. That's very valuable. Intake of calcium magnesium. Um, we don't have to talk about that much. So really the most important ones are these guys to really know as far as the role in the body. Now, acid bases. What is an acid? So we talked about acid to the respiratory system. But basically, if you are a molecule, I'm going to do a small molecule, and here's a molecule, and the molecule is, I'll make it sort of neutral. If it's going to actually be the molecule where it's happier, blood and A plus hanging off, so let's call this one H two CO three. H two H CO three minus. Those chat. Hold on. Let me click on that. Was a question? Oh, you not here? Uh oh. Okay, I'm stopping sharing. My audio, sorry, this is Denise mentioning that my audio is not working. Is anybody not hearing me? How about this? Is anybody hearing me? Yeah, yeah, it's very dark enough. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so I can, when I share, I think there's a button. Optimize. Okay. I'm going to try this. Thank you Denise, for pointing that out to me. Okay. And if it's bad again, just blurt out, hey, your audio is sketchy. My 201 people do it all the time to me. Um, so don't feel like you'd be rude because you're not. You're just helping me. Basically, what an acid is, is we did by um, carbonic acid when we did the respiratory system. So here is an acid. And it is happier. It's really kindergartner, sorry. Happier when it can kind of break apart, where it lets H plus be on its own and then it's on its own. Notice this one was H2CO3. Well, we have HCO3 and the other H is up here. So this is what an acid is. A strong acid means just lots of it is over here. And so you have lots of that. A weak acid means, all right, mostly it's here, but a little bit is over in this type. So the basic element of an acid is any molecule that tends to want to split an H plus off just in part of its balance, in part of its normal um, solute where it's going to have a little bit of this. When you have a beaker, if you're like in your prerequisite class, and you have some sort of fluid, and then you have that litmus paper. Um, so you remember the little strips of paper and then you dip it down there and then it's, you know, little paper and then it's colored and it gets like really red because it's acidic or something. The paper is actually detecting H plus. So if it's really, really red, there's a lot of H pluses. If it's towards, you know, yellow or closer to green, then it's not very many of those. That's a weak acid. So the bottom line is an acid is a molecule that is happy when it splits off an H plus. That's all. So that's the whole point of this. We quantify an acid by pH. It's a logarithmic of this H plus. And essentially, if you have a strong acid, you're gonna have a low pH. So it's kind of opposite to what people would consider. If you have a weak acid, you're gonna have a higher pH. In our body, so we've always done pH and we say neutral is seven. Okay, so if the neutral part is seven, then that's a normal if in chemistry class. We're gonna not do that as far as neutral seven because in the human body, normally this is our range. So we are slightly alkaline in a chemistry scale of things. So 
someone is considered to be acidotic if their pH is less than 7.35, whereas they're really alkaline if it's higher than 7.45. So the point here is a pH of seven is not normal in a human. So that's again, chemistry scale. This is our normal balance. Too high, you become alkaline. Too low, you're acidotic. So this is where we know. you have the sources of acid. We really have three sources. I like to put these two. I should have put these two together. So let's just say fat and protein metabolism. That's one source. If you're burning up fat and making ketone bodies or you're breaking down protein for energy, you're going to make an H plus. So you're going to become acidic. Anaerobic respiration, that's lactic acid. Okay, that's an H plus. And then excessive carbon dioxide formation. Well, remember we brought this over here? That's an H plus. So our three main sources of acid are fat and protein metabolism, anaerobic respiration, and just excessive carbon dioxide formation. Now, acid doesn't have to be a bad thing. We are our tissues make carbon dioxide. That's just what it does. And it makes our vein, venous blood more acidic. How do we deal with the acid? We have three ways to handle it. We have a chemical buffer, meaning here's a big molecule and an H plus is floating around making our pH really low. A buffer shows up and it I think we lost you. Your screen is frozen.
Okay, my computer obviously died or you are viewing Ellen's screen. Okay, I have to figure out a way to stop this screen sharing. And 